For some time I've been thinking again, and I think every preacher needs to think often of the importance of his calling. I wrote a message for the Faith Enterprise on where is the preacher. You know, we preach on the text, where's the Lord God of Elijah? Where's the Lord? And we uh, preach sometimes on where's the spirit that used to be prevalent. My heart was stirred again, and tears bathed my cheeks again as I fell off of my chair on my knees and said, Lord, uh, this is what I need too. And so I don't want any preacher to think that I'm trying to criticize or be ugly or be hard to get along with or certainly condemn my preacher brethren because the Lord knows that I appreciate the preachers. And I think the older you get, the more you want somebody to come along and be ready to take the old King James torch and go on. And I do mean exactly that. And for these 38 years that I've been preaching, I've preached out of one Bible. I mean, the King James Version, which to me has met all of my personal needs. Uh, when I was lost, it convicted me and I was saved. When I was stumbling through life as uh, a useless Christian and member of the church, it uh, revealed to me the will of God. And then it provided my provisions as I went off to Baylor University. And through these many years and many dark valleys and uh, some steep mountains I've climbed by the grace of God and launched and plunged uh, year after year by faith. And uh, the Bible has uh, shown me the way and revealed to me the perfect will of God for my life. I haven't always done it. I'd be quick and first to say that. But I know one thing, the will of God's in the Word of God. And there's no need, no need anybody going wrong as long as you've got a Bible. I'm getting more letters than I've ever gotten in my life saying, Brother Olaf, I'm, I'm unable to find help. I mean, uh, who can I counsel with? Where can I go? Uh, I, I can always say, it go to your Bible. I believe the Holy Spirit will reveal to you his will if you'll just humble. He said, if any man will do the will of God, doctrine, uh, the, uh, John chapter 7, 17, if any man will do the will of God, the doctrine shall be made known to him. You girls many times are perplexed and say, where am I going from here? We'll do the best while you're here and wait till that come. And when you leave, I believe the Lord will begin to reveal to you and show you where you need to go. Living grace, day by day. You have your Bible, turn with me, please, to chapter 10, the book of Romans. I have two great texts tonight uh, that I want to share with you. And you pray now that we might have an old-fashioned preaching service where the truth will fall out in pleasant lines, as the Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher? Didn't say a teacher, did it? Didn't say a religious film. It didn't say a book report. It said, how shall they hear without a preacher? I believe, and I really am convinced of this, I believe the greatest trouble in America today is we're running short of preaching preachers. And I can prove it before I'm through. I mean, I'll prove it to my own satisfaction. I'll promise you that. I believe that the key man today in the downfall of America is the preacher. And I believe that the key man that's been in the success and the blessings on America has been the preacher. I guarantee you when Elisha saw Elijah go up, you know what he called him? He saw him going through the air and he said, My father, my father. The horses and chariots of Israel. Yonder they go. You know what that meant? Stand an army. That, yonder goes our protection, not yonder. Old brother Elijah. Brother, he stood in the palace of the king, or he stood in the garden of Naboth, and told old Ahab just exactly, if I could put it in common parlance, how the cow ate the cabbage. I mean, he, he dropped the hammer on him, said, You sorry rascal, you. I mean, actually, that's what he let him know. Old Ahab said, Art thou he who troubleth Israel? You old troublemaker, you. Never preacher, never preached the truth, been a troublemaker. I've made trouble for Corpus Christi for 27 years. I've made trouble everywhere I've ever gone. Not for God's people, just for the devil's crowd. God's people have been the happiest people in the world. We've gotten along so splendidly. And I believe I'm more patient and easy to get along with than I've ever been in my life because we ought to be as we go. We ought to be full of grace and truth and we ought to be full of love and compassion 
And so it's certainly not a desire of mine to just stir up unnecessary trouble, but you can't keep from stirring up trouble when you preach the gospel. And so he called him, he said, are you the one that trouble in Israel? No, sir, he said, you the troublemaker. And your wife has stirred it up. Old Jezebel has stirred you up to work wickedness. And he said, I've got news for you, Mr. Ahab. You may be the king, but the dogs of the street are going to lick your blood in the streets of Jezreel. And I'll guarantee you that's exactly what happened. Elijah told him, he said, them old dogs that run the streets of Jezreel will look up your unworthy blood because of what you've done to Naboth and his two boys, taking his vineyard away. And he said, I'll tell you something else. He said, the dogs are going to eat the body of your wife, the queen. They're going to eat her up one of these days. And three years later, Ahab was being driven down the street with his blood running out from the arrows that had been shot into his body. And those old dogs came down the street and licked up the water that they washed the carriage with, trying to get a little something to eat. Human blood. And 20 years later, when they pitched the carcass of old wicked Jezebel down and she spattered in the street, the dogs came and ate everything about her except her devilish hands that wrote the death plot for Naboth and that nasty brain of hers that concocted such a dirty plan and... Brother, God meant exactly what he said, and he said it through a man called Elijah the prophet. And he's still preaching and speaking, and he'll do it through men. And we need preachers today. Our church is in the fix hour because of sorry Casper Milk Toast uh, preaching. We need some preachers today. I believe we need preachers today. He said, how can they hear without a preacher? How are they going to hear without a preacher? We had somebody in the service this past Thursday night mixed up in a church with all this modern uh, new lyrics and all this bunch of uh, half church and half hippie music and all this bunch of rock and roll and this bunch of combos and a bunch of junk coming up in the pulpits today leaving out amazing grace. And he said, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. I want to get away from it. And he said, I'm ready to pull out. And yet, that's the way we're trying to win the world, is to live like the world, sound like the world, sing like the world, l look like the world, smell like the world, drag around like the world. You'll never win the world like that. Never! God's preachers have never been able to compromise and have victory from the Lord. I'm talking about preaching tonight. Let me give you my main text now so you can begin to think about them. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. What a tremendous chapter this is. You may read it all when you get home or to your room tonight, but I'll begin reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And then I want you to notice what he called. Verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught, things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him, of him, are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Then turn with me, please, for that context. You know, the old preachers used to always have a text and a context. A context means ones that goes with one. They usually took a text from the Old Testament and said our New Testament context 
Well, we'll give you a context tonight found in Titus, in Titus chapter 1, verse 3. But hath in due times, that's all in the way, that's the only time God ever pays attention to, due time. In due times manifested his word through preaching. Hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto us according to the commandment of God our Savior. Now then, how does God reveal himself through preaching? Turn with me please to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and uh, verse 7. Whereunto I'm, an, I'm ordained a preacher. That's real ordination there. I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Lifting up what kind of hands? Holy hands. Well, you could read on that, couldn't you? In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and so bright and not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Reckon how women got so far away from that. How did we ever just completely forsake the ship of real chastity and modesty? I mean, how did we ever get so far? Women, think it over. Pray about it. And then wonder sometimes if God's blessing you like he did the holy women of old who had their main decorations on the inside. We could read a little further if you wanted to. All right? But which becometh women professing godliness with good works. I don't mind a woman of the world looking like a woman of the world, but I tell you, when God's women... And God's ladies begin to look like the women of the world. That's not right. Which becometh women professing what? Godliness. If you profess to be a godly woman, then you ought to look like one and act like one. And the verse 11 said, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. People say to me, Brother Olaf, what do you suppose that means? Why, I suppose it means what it said. I didn't have any in trouble understanding that. It just said, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. I believe if the men would take their place like they ought to, the women would get back in their place. Men ought to be the leaders. Say what you please. This is just plain Bible truth, and these are some of the things that we've gotten away from. Turn to Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2, and it'll be verse 5. Let's see maybe if the gospel is to have any fruit and see what he has to say about it. All right, Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, And spared, not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overflow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Now, is, is Corpus Christi living ungodly? Is America living ungodly? He said, you got an example. You got an example of those that should after live ungodly. There's destruction going to come. And so he said, Noah was what kind of a man? He was a preacher. What did he preach? He preached righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Dear friend, you can turn into the New Testament and you'll find John came a-preaching, Jesus came a-preaching, and the Bible said uh, they repented at the preaching of Jonah. One man. Have you ever thought about that? No publicity, no welcome committee, no organization, no arrangement, no nothing. God called, and the thing about it is God called a backslidden, disobedient preacher to do the preaching. <laughs> Must have been running off a short of preachers back there. But he called a man with the name of Jonah and said, I want you to go down to Nineveh and cry against that city because their sin has come up before me and I want you to go preach. And Jonah, the Bible said, went down and got him a ship going to Tarshish, which is in the wrong direction, and he paid the fare and a storm arose at sea. What a storm they had. And that bunch of heathens began to unload the ship and throw everything they had overboard. 
and directly one of them, they all prayed to every god they could think of, and uh, one of them said, say, we had a stowaway around here. Where's that guy that bought him a ticket? Where's he? Well, said, go find him. He may have a god in, that he could talk to. said, we're going to need all the help we can get. I mean, look like our god, just not doing too good. And this old storm is not letting up a bit. Go down there and see where he is. Went down there, and you know where they found him? Found him right where the church is now, sound asleep. Right where the average preacher is today, unstirrable. Never gets stirred up about nothing unless it's a football game or a television program. I'm talking about preaching tonight. And so he went out and said, Listen, wake up, thou sleeper, and call upon God if you have one. Jonah said, Oh, me. I sure got one, all right. That's reading this storm on y'all, too. They cast lots. You remember that? They, ca- they didn't know how to find the will of God. They just cast lots. And, of course, it fell right on top of old Jonah. Backslidden preacher caused the storm. Are you listening? Brother, if a backslidden preacher caused a storm to come on the heathen world back there, then he'll do it again. That's exactly why we're in the storm we're in right now. I mean, I'm talking to Brother Roloff tonight. And I'm not trying to be self-righteous or overly pious. Or hum- I'm just simply saying, if all of us preachers would preach the truth, Jeremiah said, if you'd have warned the people of the sins and preached the statutes and the, uh, the, the Word of God, then I would have turned them from their sin. I believe that's right. Let me ask you this. What turns you to righteousness from sin? Preaching. 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 I mean, that's what God uses. I believe that preaching is God's main means, and we need preachers uh, that will preach the unsearchable riches of Christ Jesus. The Bible said Jesus came a-preaching. The Bible said in Luke 8, chapter 1, he went through every city and village preaching and showing glad tidings. Mark 9, in verse 6, said he went through the towns of-preaching. Acts 8. Turn with me, please. Acts 8. Uh, you know the book of Acts is actually the church at work when it had the power of God upon it. And in the book of Acts, chapter 8, and verse 4, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere. What were they doing? Preaching the word. Preaching the word. My, listen, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached. What did he preach? Preach Christ unto them. Turn a little further in the chapter. Ethiopian eunuch, after a revival had been sort of, at least the preacher had been sent on down the road and came to this desert road and he found this man riding along in the carriage. And this was a deacon by the name of Philip. And the Ethiopian eunuch got together and he said, Go join thyself to him. And the Bible said, uh, Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, verse 30. And he said, Do you understand what you're reading? He said, How can I accept some dear lady teach me or guide me? No, that's not what it said, and praise God for Bible women. But it happened to be that he How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. He was reading the book of Isaiah about being led as a sheep to the slaughter. Like a lamb done before his shearer, so openeth he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this of himself or of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Listen, one of the secrets of loving, wonderful joy in preaching is to be able to open at any scripture and preach Jesus. When you miss Jesus in the Bible, you've missed the Bible. When you miss salvation by grace, you've missed salvation. When you miss the the truth about Jesus, who's the grand subject of the Bible and the center of the entire Word of God. You know what Jesus said one day? He said, I came to do thy will as, as it is written in the volume of the book, to do thy will. About me. Did you know what the Bible's written about? Jesus. 
You know the one man that the Bible talks about? You know the, the man that the Bible prophesied about? Jesus in the Old Testament. You know the man that fulfilled that prophecy? It was Jesus. You know the man that the Bible talks about in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Just one man. His name was Jesus. You know who all the letters were written about to the churches? It's just Jesus. That's right. You know the final book of the Bible uh, uh, that was written, the book of Revelation? You know it was the revelation of what? Jesus Christ. Not the revelation of John. It's revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ. Brother, the whole Bible from Genesis to the book of Revelation is centered in and around our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 10, verse 36. Will you read with me, please? 10 and verse 36. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He's Lord of all. We've tried to fight our way through peace. We never will have peace through a, ba a bloody battlefield. Never will. Those are carnal swords, and Jesus said, Put up thy sword again, uh, because he that takes the sword shall perish with the sword. And that's exactly what the world is doing. We've bled ourselves white financially and spiritually because of our godless wars. I don't know of a war that we ever have, but what it's either a material warfare or it's a religious warfare. One of the two. It's either for money or it's for some religion somewhere. And many people have been killed in religious crusades, what they call the Christian. They were unchristian crusades. Fifteen children being killed in one day because of a godless church and religion told their people, if you'll go fight for our denomination, if you please, you won't even stop on your way after death to heaven. You'll go right on straight in. Let me tell you something. God doesn't have but one plan, and without Christ, you're going to go to hell. That's the only place you could go. And without the say, you can join all the churches in town. You can fight a dozen battles and get Oak Leaf clusters stuck all over you and every medal that Uncle Sam can give you. And without Christ, you'll bust hell wide open. I don't want you to, but that's exactly what's going to happen to you. Just being here is not going to save you. I want to read just a little bit more, though, before we come to some other parts. Turn to the book of 1 Corinthians. We read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. Uh, after that in wisdom, God the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. Now let's turn right on to the 15th chapter. To the 15th chapter of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is a tremendous chapter. And we'll come to this chapter, I'm sure, tomorrow that has to do with the greatest miracle the world has ever known. It's either fact or fiction. And uh, we'll never have the right kind of faith until we have the right kind of facts. Because the right kind of faith is built on the facts. I mean, something that really happened. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 14. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. Vain preaching. Vain preaching. Unless Christ is risen. If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. And your faith is also Vain, and we're found liars or false witnesses of God because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. Turn with me please to the book of Mark chapter 1 and verse 38. Mark, Matthew, Mark chapter 1 and verse 38. I want to get the relation of preaching between Jesus and uh, his ministry. 1 in verse 38, the book of Mark. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. Did you get that? I've never had that thing to grip me till this week. He said, uh, I've got to go preach. I've got to go preach. Jesus was a preacher, called of God, sin of God, that I may preach there also, for that's the reason I came forth. To do what? To preach. Now then, he didn't just preach with his lips, and that's the weakest preaching we ever do, unless our life backs it up. I think of the old statement I read many, many years ago that the colored man made, said, you can't preach cream and live, skim milk. Another one spoke up and said, No, and you can't come back from where you ain't never been. And that's right. And so you cannot divorce your believing from your behaving and your preaching. And Jesus came. He said, I came forth to preach. And he was the greatest preacher that this old world has ever known. Turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 61. 
To me, this is the golden-hearted and the golden-voiced preacher of the Old Testament. 61. Isaiah, I guess, didn't know that he was writing something that Jesus would really grab and preach. But he saw Jesus coming 750 years before he ever got here. He saw the suffering servant, gave it as recorded in uh, Isaiah 53 and, and uh, 7 and verse, uh, chapter 9 and verse 14. He saw Jesus. Now then, let's take the text. The Spirit of the Lord God's upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy. That's the joy oil, the joy oil. For mourning, the garment of praise, for the spirit of heaviness. Dear friends, uh, the Holy Spirit wears the garment. Of praise. Now turn to Luke, and let's see if Jesus ever came to that. Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. Here comes the preacher now. He's looking for a text. Here comes the only man that never sinned, sent from heaven, God's beloved son, uh, who was born of a virgin. And he uh, wants the book, and he wants the Bible. He's going to preach his first sermon now, and he asked for something to read out, and he gave him the book of Isaiah. And so he took Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, and it's recorded in uh, chapter 4. Now let's go back to the first part of the chapter first. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, that's the first requirement of a preacher, returned from Jordan, returned from Jordan, that's where he was, that's where he was obedient. He was baptized at Jordan. And I believe every preacher needs to be obedient. And he was led by the Spirit, whereabouts? Into the wilderness. That's where we're living now. We live in the wilderness. This is the wilderness right now. We're living in it now. And he was tempted 40 days, and he had a bout with the devil, and he defeated the devil with the word of God. Now then, after he's filled with the Spirit, after, it didn't say anything about going off to college, but he said he was filled with the Holy Ghost, and he came back from Jordan, and he was led by the Spirit. He met the devil, defeated the devil. Now he's ready to go to preaching. And brother, as far as I'm concerned, this is the steps that ought to make a preacher right here. He was sent of God, and now then he's going to take a text. Let's see what he preached on. Uh, he said uh, that was delivered, verse 17, that was delivered unto him the book, the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And here's what it said. The Spirit of the Lord's upon me, because it anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. What was the first thing he did when the Holy Spirit got upon him? Started preaching. Because it anointed me. Oh, my preacher brethren, today out across Radio Land and here in the service, if Jesus had to be anointed by the Spirit, what do you think about me and you? I mean, he was perfect. He had no sin. And he, he was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. He closed the book. And then he began to preach. And uh, he said, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Notice something. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of the mouth. Did you get it? They didn't marvel at his wonderful appearance. They wondered at his words, his marvelous and gracious words. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? No, it's not Joseph's son. It's his foster son. That's the reason he got in so much trouble. They couldn't figure out he was God's son, see. He was not Joseph's son. He was God's son. Let's read on. Turn to the 36th verse. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word, not what a man, what a word. What a word is this, for with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. And notice verse 40. Now, when the sun was setting... And when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with divers diseases brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Verse 43, And he said unto them, I must preach. I must preach. I must preach. Brother, he was the preacher. God uh, sent Jesus in this old world to preach. Turn with me, please to the book 
of Matthew chapter 10 and verse 27. Matthew 10 and verse 27. This is strange preaching. This is a strange pulpit. Talking about the housetop preaching. He said, I want you to tell it on the housetop. What I tell you in darkness, that speak you in the light. Yes, and what you hear in the ear, that preach you up on the housetops. Verse 27, get on the housetop and preach it. That's an unusual place, but he said, tell it from wherever you are. And tell it and let it reach. I was before public address systems, I imagine, wasn't it? And he could reach more people from the housetop. Don't be ashamed. He said, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul, or soul and body, in hell. Turn to another passage, chapter 14. Excuse me, Luke chapter 9 and verse 60. Now this is one that the world won't receive. This is where people are going to part company with me right here. This is the most drastic thing I know about preaching in the Bible. I know of nothing. Now, Jesus is gathering some recruits, and people are saying, I believe I'd like to go with you. Verse 57, Lord, I'll follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. And he said, Lord, suffer me first to go bear my father. Looks to me like anybody could get a permit to go to a funeral, especially if it's his father. I'm talking about the most drastic thing I know, and that's the price of preaching. He said, suffer me first, or permit me. That's what the word suffer means in the King James Version. Permit me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, let the dead bear their dead. Go thou preach. Preaching's more important than funerals. That's the reason I got to preach the funerals. That's the reason I'm going to preach the gospel at the funeral time. Now, we'll forget preaching that funeral for our good friend up in Tennessee who got killed in the car wreck, one of the greatest preachers of our generation. And his son's falling looked like in his footsteps. And uh, I've never heard, I think, a preacher that could handle the Word of God more skillfully. God blessed him. He got killed in the car wreck. But I tell you what, and, of course, we had, I believe it was 300 preachers about that uh, that came, and people were gathered every which way. You never saw so many people, and we preached and gave an invitation. His own son came, you remember, and fell at the casket and said, I'll take the torch that my dad left. And uh, he's preaching the gospel like his dad today. And uh, people got saved at the funeral. I believe that's what a funeral ought to be for. Oh, listen, I tell you, dear friends, we need, we need people with real faith today. And uh, Lord, he said, I want you to just let the dead bear their dead. The most important thing I'm trying to say is the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now then, turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16. 1 Corinthians. It would be impossible to read all the verses and chapters concerning uh, the preaching of the gospel. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9 and verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is me unto me. Woe is unto me. If I preach not the gospel, there's a curse of God on me. If I preach not the gospel, oh, what a call the Lord gave me when he called me to preach. And every preacher needs to know. And I sign them in a letter to my preacher, brethren, yours in the highest calling. Yours in the highest calling. Woe is unto me. Don't brag on me. God called me and put me into the ministry. And as, John, as Amos said, the Lord took me. And God took a preacher by the name of Jonah. And after he'd taken a boat ride and the fish ride, he hit the ground running to Nineveh and went through the city preaching one message on repentance. And a city of 600,000 souls in ignorance and heathenism were saved because of preaching. preaching. The Bible said that the city of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. He was not a perfect man, but he preached a wonderful message of repentance, the message that we need today. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5 for just a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and uh, verse 5. He said, we preach not ourselves. This is a great text. We preach not ourselves. I wish I could say we preach not our church. We preach not our denomination. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves, your servants. For Jesus' sake, no wonder God honored and blessed the preaching that he preached. And dear friends, I remind you 
But there's just one thing that God uses more than he does anything else, and that's the preaching of the Word of God. I long to see preaching again like we used to see it when the nation was great. I want you to turn with me to the book of, uh, the book of Acts chapter 9. I hadn't seen this until this week. Chapter 9, the book of Acts chapter 9. Uh, they're given a report, and I think we'll read a couple of verses to show you uh, what they were talking about. Acts chapter 9, verse 20. Verse 20, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues. He's the Son of God. That's costly preaching in the synagogue. He straightway preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. Now turn to the 27th verse and see what report we got. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. You see, Barnabas was the fellow that was always taken up for the underdog, and Paul was in trouble. See, Paul had been saved. You see, in the uh, in, he'd just gotten saved, and he was three days without sight, and, and God took a hold of him and made a preacher out of him, and the fellows were afraid. They said, listen, we are not got anything to do with him. That's a trick. He coming in here. Well, he's, he's a, he, he up killed Stephen. I mean, he held a clothes while Stephen died, and while they stoned him to death. And uh, Barnabas always took up. You remember when... Uh, when uh, uh, Paul came back and Mark had turned back on him and Mark said, I, I, I just, uh, these mosquitoes or something's getting me. He went on back home and Paul came back and, and then Paul got ready to go again and, and Mark said, I'm ready. Got my suitcase packed. He said, you need to pack it far as going with me. I'm, you're not going, big sissy, you. I'm not going to take anybody to go and turn back on me. But I told him the mission field when I needed you and here you were trucking toward home. Your mama's feather bed. Brother, you can just stay here. And the old, I imagine Mark began to weep and cry and said, Brother Paul, I won't do it no more. And old Mark got him off and said, I tell you, you go with me. You go with me. We'll go. We'll fix us up a team, see? And of course, you know, Paul got him another partner. But don't forget, Paul never had a permanent falling out with him because you remember when he's over there, ready to go home to be with the Lord? He said, bring Mark with you. He said, he's profitable unto me. <laughs> he's a fine boy. And I, I'm glad he put that in there because somebody said, well, you see how to fall out and never get straightened up. Listen, you silly outfit, you. If you're a Christian, you're not supposed to have any trouble with any other Christian. You don't get straightened out. I don't care who you are. Anytime you girls have a fall out and don't get straightened out, you don't act like you know Christ. And anytime any of our workers, and I don't know of any like that, but anytime any of our workers get to where we can't get along with each other, we're acting like we never have even been saved. I'll tell you, God's people ought to behave like God's people. And so notice how he convinced them. Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached. Ooh, you ought to hear that fellow preach. Well, that convinced them. They said, listen, I mean, Barnabas, he, he, he knew preaching. He knew preaching when he heard it. He said, let me tell you something, fellow. If he hadn't been saved, he just couldn't preach what he'd been preaching. And you know what? Preaching proved to them that Paul had been saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I tell you, if a fellow can preach, he can prove to the world he's saved. I mean, that's a proof of the preacher's salvation is that he can preach and present uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I tell you, as I bring this message to a close tonight, preaching. Let me show you what you get through preaching. Number one, this is how important it is. It's so important that God wouldn't just let anybody preach. He calls his preachers, special preachers. Now, notice what kind he called. Not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise men of the flesh, that no flesh should glory in his presence. He calls, look like about the weakest things in the country. Hardly ever does God go get a lawyer or a speech teacher. You hardly ever, have you ever heard a man get up and said, well, I was teaching oratory in the college. I was the speech teacher. I taught them how to enunciate their words. I taught them how to speak and how to debate. You never hear, I never heard a man like that got called preaching in my life. I hear a lot of preachers get up and said, well, I was out there in the country and I was on the farm. And the one said, I was up sycamore tree and God took me. And, and this little preacher said, I was on single row color and the Lord called me. And I mean, that's about the way the Lord does it. Why? That we wouldn't brag about it after we amounted to something for God and got something done for Him. That no flesh should glory. In his, there's no place in the ministry of the pulpit for one of these proud peacock preachers. Not any at all. I mean, we have nothing to brag. Paul said, uh, uh, no honor to me. I mean, fact is, woe is me if I preach not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I say, number one, God called preachers. I remember what the old preachers used to say. I used to hear them sitting in the pews as a little kid. If you can stay out of the ministry and be happy, don't ever get into it. In other words, if you, can, if you can be happy not preaching, you have no business preaching. But when God calls you to preach, he wants us to preach. 
Yes, what a calling. Why, I'd rather be a preacher than all the kings and presidents of the United States. I, I say with my hand raised to heaven, if they were to call me from the White House right now and say, Brother Olaf, uh, they have just, uh, the president has just resigned and he's requested and the cabinet and the Congress and the representatives and all the people in America have just voted unanimously for you to be the president of these great United States of America. Why, in a single second, I'd say, I can't stand the demotion. I mean, I could not go down to be the president when God's called me up to be a preacher. Now, I'm not bragging except on the Lord. What a tremendous calling and honor it is to be in the ministry. Think about it. Souls hanging in the balance. I've got the most important task and calling in the world is to get people saved. Well, I'm going to see my products throughout eternity. The president will see his in time. I'll see mine in eternity. Oh, listen, the highest calling in this world is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'd like to say two or three things. The, the first thing, the second thing about it, not only am I called, but Jesus came to preach. That was his business. As the Father sent me in the world, even so send I you. He sent him to preach. He sent me to preach. And then something else. God gave me a special book to preach. He wrote one book for me to preach out, and that's all I need. I don't need anything else. Just need one book. He gave me one book. He said, now, I'm going to give you all the sermons you'll ever need. You'll find them in my book. He gave me a special book to preach out of. He gave me a special calling, and then he, he gave me a special place. He always leads and guides and puts me in some place to preach the gospel. And he chose the foolishness of preaching I didn't understand that for a long time. Not foolish preaching now, but the foolishness of preaching. Would it seem foolish to you? I went and knocked on some doors tonight, some big two-story houses over there on Furman and some friends that I've known through the years. And uh, what if the house had been burning down? If It would seem foolish for me to stand there and beg the people to come out, wouldn't it? I would. Or if necessary, I'd go in and drag them out. I really would. I, even if I broke a leg dragging them, I'd get them out. Why? That doesn't sound foolish. Wouldn't have to do that. And then I'd like to say something to the preachers before I close. I believe preachers were going to have to make more of the Word of God. I went into a preacher's church the other day. He didn't even bring his Bible. It reminded me of a carpenter going out on the job without a hammer and a saw. Reminded me of a fisherman going fishing didn't have any rod or reel. Reckon why he forgot it. It don't mean much to him. And I'll guarantee you it wasn't because he could quote it, because I'll promise you this, I'll guarantee you, and I really believe I'm right, if that preacher were called on to preach, to, to quote five chapters of the Word of God, he couldn't do it to save his life. Preachers, we're going to have to get back in this book. I, I need to live in this book. And there's no way to live by faith except to live in this book. Brother... When we get to where we can't live by faith, we ought to die and get out of this thing. If we ever have to have a financial racket and a bunch of budgets and cards and pledges, then as far as I'm concerned, let's close up shop. God still cares for his own. God will support preaching. And I know that one of my needs, and I'm going to make a request tonight, I want you to pray that God will help me to preach uh, more preaching, better preaching, more anointed preaching, the blood, the resurrection, the death, and all the good things of God. Because through this, everything we've got in the enterprises revolves around preaching. And you folks better pray for the preaching, I'll tell you that. You workers better pray for the preaching, and you better practice the preaching that I've been doing. I'm not trying to uh, put pressure on, I'm just simply saying, if we want God to bless us, we better preach right and practice right. Yes, sir. Oh, I, there's no substitute. I trust that we haven't got a worker among us in the enterprises that doesn't seek with his dead level best to live the way we preach and live a separated life. My heart's burdened tonight about a lot of things. But I'm saying this, Jesus is either coming or he's going to provide what he's told us to pray about and what he's given us a burden to bear. Time has come when I don't believe I can go on without hearing from heaven in a more tremendous way, even though it's been gracious. And I'm addicted to living by faith, and I believe faith honors God, and honor God honors faith. And 
we must have. And then I, I believe it's all built around preaching. All of it built around preaching the Word of God. I'm sorry the churches tried to build churches around Sunday schools. A lot of people don't want to come out here because we don't have a graded, organized Sunday school. I wouldn't mind having one if it'd get people saved. But the main way is get God told me to preach. They'd say, well, Brother Lord, what sort of recreation you have for your young people out there in your church? Well, we'll have prayer and singing, exercise vocal cords, and get down and get up off of the knees and kneel down on the altar, you know. And I mean, that's the kind of exercise I believe the New Testament church had. You thinking about a lot of worldly entertainment? I think about the old preachers. You think of it. The old preachers that walked the shores of Galilee and yet they outrun all the rest of us and got more done. Jesus never rode in a modern car. I guess he never rode. The nearest to a vehicle he ever rode was an old donkey and he sure wasn't very fast, but he made it in on time, didn't he? Jesus preached out of a barred boat, stood on the seashore and preached and stood out in the corn patch or out in the field and preached and fed the multitude. Jesus Christ had no place to lay his head, and uh, foxes were better cared for than Jesus was. The old eagle had more of a nest than he had a bedroom, and yet Jesus Christ got everything done he's supposed to have done, and when he hung on the cross, he said, it's finished. It's finished. The old preachers used to come. They had no PA systems. They'd go to an old schoolhouse or they'd go to some place and preach. I've been told and I've read about the old preachers that had to preach so loud because the crowds were in the wind was blowing in the open air. A lot different now. Oh, may the Lord help us. People, when they get right with the Lord, they love to go to preaching. Oh, would you let me bear my testimony and I close the message. I love preaching because my mother was saved because some preacher preached and gives me the hope that soon now I'll see her blessed face again. My old daddy one morning turned them old mules loose and said, Boys, uh, take them out. When you get back to the inn, we're going to preaching this morning. Right during the week, grass is a-growing, the cotton is a-growing, the old corn is a-tasseling. <laughs> well, we got in that old tea model and drove over to church. And I was a little old boy sitting there looking around. All of a sudden, that old Methodist preacher gave an invitation. My old daddy looked like a dead man, started walking down the aisle. Fell down on his old knees, such a timid but a wicked man for a while. Fell down on his knees, and that little old preacher got under with him, and he gave his heart to Christ. The preacher won my daddy to Christ through preaching. And when my daddy lay in his casket, he wasn't in his casket, I believe he was with my mama in another world. How? Through preaching. Through preaching. This little old boy sat in a little old country church right down from the Methodist church. And that preacher, Brother W.A. Cockrell, who went to be with the Lord not long ago, stood there and preached the Word of God. I got scared of my sin and scared of hell, and I ran to Jesus for refuge, and I got saved.